If someone is drowning, you have to give them your hand. When the war started, all of Poland was drowning in a sea of blood, and those who were drowning the most were the Jews. And among the Jews, the worst off were the children. So I had to give them my hand. These are the words of Irina Sindler. Codename, Yolanta. Irina Sindler was truly a light in the dark. She and her co-conspirators smuggled 2,500 Jewish children out of the Warsaw Ghetto during the Holocaust. She was born in Otwok, Poland in 1910 to a Catholic family. Her parents were Stanisław and Janina Krzyzanowski. The person that influenced her life the most was her father. He had told her, if someone is drowning, you must save them even if you cannot swim. He had also told her that people should be separated into good and evil, and not by race or religion. 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Under the Nazi world government, all human rights were suspended for the people of Poland. The worst off, of course, were the Jews. In November of 1940, the Warsaw Ghetto was completed. This was an enclosed area of 16 blocks. High brick walls surrounded the area with broken glass on top and barbed wire. 450,000 Jewish people were forced into these 16 blocks. During this time, many of the Gentile Poles turned their backs on the Jewish people. The conditions inside the ghetto were horrible. The food rations for a Jew equaled about 180 calories a day, though an average person requires around 1,800. The ghetto was crowded. Several families had to share a room. Others lived on stairs, hallways, or in the streets. Disease and lice were rampant, and about 5,000 Jews died each month from starvation or disease. Irina often posed as a nurse. She obtained passes from a physician friend in the epidemic control department that allowed her and her co-conspirator to enter the ghetto at will. She would pretend she was entering to prevent the spread of disease. She would make daily visits bringing money, food, medicine, and clothing. Substantial quantities of these items were brought into the ghetto with the help of plumbers, electricians, and other Polish workers who were able to bring trucks into the ghetto. In late 1942, deportations began. Hitler's final solution was to exterminate the Jewish race. Every day, six to seven thousand Jewish people were rounded up and taken to Umschlagplatz, the area where they were placed into cattle cars and sent for relocation. Of course, they were not really being relocated. Almost everyone in the Warsaw Ghetto was sent to Treblinka. This camp, unlike some of the others, was just a death camp. It contained little more than gas chambers and crematories. Irina decided it was best to focus on saving the children. News of the death camps traveled fast. Zhigoto was formed. This was a secret underground organization that offered aid to the Jews. It was supported by the Polish government in exile in London. Irina was placed in charge of the children's division and continued using her code name, Yolanta. When we were going to the ghetto to pick up those children, there were terrible scenes happening. One mother wanted a child to leave while her father did not. The grandmother wanted, the mother did not. They were asking what was the guarantee. What kind of a guarantee could I give them? I could not even give them a guarantee that I would get past the sentry. I was escorting the children and infants past the sentry in a very secretive way. Great appreciation should be given to the building caretakers who were located between the ghetto and the area inside. Thanks to their courage, I was able to go through. But I always could have come across an anti-Semitic caretaker who could have killed me and the Jewish child too. I could not give a Jewish family any guarantee a child would live. In those cases, very often, I was not given a child, and I was left frustrated and often crying. The next day, when I went back to the building to try again to convince them, it was too late. Irina began the task of smuggling the children out of the ghetto. This was very risky. Even if she managed to get them past the guards, the children had to be hidden and taken care of on the outside. Irina found many brave people willing to help with this cause. The orphanages were willing as well as brave families. 
Irina kept a record of the children's names on thin pieces of tissue paper. The information was written in code and contained the child's real name, new Polish name, and destination. The purpose was to return the children to their families after the war. This list was critical because it helped preserve the child's identity. Irina alone kept the record of the children's names. She would place the names in a jar and bury the jar under an apple tree in a friend's yard in full view of the German barracks. No, they got that, uh, no, there was a policeman involved in getting me out of the ghetto, but I didn't know that he was part of the Gota. You see, those things were very, very quiet. People, and the less I knew, it was easier for them because if I would be caught and they would torture me, I would be, uh, somehow they were afraid I would be, be uh, I would betray them by saying something which I shouldn't. So they, we didn't know much. Everything was very quietly done. On October 20th, 1943, the Gestapo came to Irina's house. She threw the list to her friend who quickly tucked it in her bra. The Gestapo searched her home but found nothing. She was taken to the harshest prison of the time, Paviat Prison. One of her co-conspirators had given her name under torture and now they wanted her organization and the list. Irina was brutally tortured. They fractured both legs and her feet and crippled her for life. Still, she would not disclose any information. Irina was sentenced to death and again escaped this fate because she go to bribe a guard. He helped her out and placed her name on the list of executed prisoners. When the Germans found out, the guard was sent to the Russian front and Irina was in hiding, much like the children she had helped. Uh, Irina's similar story was not known after the war because when communism took over in 1945 and 46, they considered her to be a subversive. She had been in the underground, it was one strike against her, she was helping Jewish people. For the communists, that was two strikes. And so, for the next 10 or 20 years, the communist government hassled her. After the release of the movie Schindler's List, U.S. and News World Reports had an article called The Other Schindlers. In their March 1994 edition, the article included a section on Irina Schindler, but still, her name was not well known. In 1999, four girls from Kansas looking for a National History Day topic read the article on Irina and did further research. This was not an easy task considering the girls only found one website that mentioned Irina's name. While looking for Irina's gravesite, the girls found that Irina was still alive. They wrote to Irina knowing that the chances of her replying were very small. They enclosed enough money for her to reply just in case. Not much later, the girls received a seven-page letter from Irina, written in Polish. After finding a translator, the girls were shocked at how loving and generous Irina had been when writing the letter. Irina shared with them first-hand accounts and the struggle she endured. She had opened the letter with, My dear girls, very close to my heart. The girls found a receipt enclosed with the letter, showing that she had donated the money they had sent to her to a boy's home. The girls continued writing letters to Irina, and of course Irina continued replying. She would decorate the letters with stickers, usually shaped like hearts. In 2001, the girls went to Poland and visited Irina. They went back five times. The first time they visited, Irina presented them each with a silver heart necklace. With the help of the girls' project, Irina was much better known around the world. They still present their performance, Life in a Jar, today. It's so important to keep her story known, to, con to continue sharing her story with the world, um, so that something like the Holocaust can never happen again. And it's such a strong story that the Polish community has captured and are holding tight that a strong Polish woman was able to stand up for what she believed in and change the lives of so many. Irina died on May 12, 2008, at age 98. She was a very caring person with intentions of changing the world. Irina saved those 2,500 children and has inspired many. She has showed us that there is always going to be a small light, no matter how dark things may seem.